Hello everyone, apologies for the uh, very, very slight delay of having some technical issues on our side that we hope to have uh, resolved very shortly. Uh, ordinarily, you'd be hearing from uh, Kara Vincent, the Knowledge Translator here at uh, SIPCERT. Uh, my name is Kyle Leach, I'm one of the uh, Communications and Social Media Specialists here at the organization. Uh, with us we have, of course, Dr. Simon Hatcher. Uh, thank you all for joining the webinar and for hanging tight while we uh, resolve some of our technical issues. Uh, we do have just a little bit of housekeeping to get to, um, so I hope you'll bear with me just a few seconds longer and then we'll uh, turn things over to Dr. Hatcher. So thank you for joining us for the webinar, Suicide Prevention in Public Zoo. Oh no, we've lost Dr. Hatcher. Uh, thank oh, you for joining us. Oh, he's still here. Oh, perfect. Thanks so much. You uh, disturbed people with pictures of me. I see. Uh, so, oh, uh, if you want to just go back to the, oh, that's fine. Um, uh, before we begin, uh, we'd like to acknowledge that the University of Regina is situated on Treaty 4 lands of the presence in Treaty 6 territories. These are the territories of the Nehawayak, Anish oh boy, Anishinaabek, excuse me, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nichif Nation. Apologies for my stumbling there. Uh, oh boy, so all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. Uh, this is to limit the ambient noise and feedback during the presentation. Uh, today's session will be recorded and a copy of the recording will be sent out to everyone that registered uh, within 48 hours of the conclusion. Uh, please use the question box to ask questions throughout the presentation and those will be sent to our uh, presenter throughout. Um, some organizations do block the GoToWebinar launch window. Uh, this means you may have to join us by phone if you're having trouble hearing or viewing the session. Perfect. Uh, so to access uh, real-time French captioning of the webinar, please use that you see on the screen. Um, you can also use the QR code to the left. Uh, the link has also been posted in the chat. Uh, the link will direct you to a software platform uh, called Wordly, which will enable you to access simultaneous French captioning of the webinar. And uh, by way of disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this webinar belong solely to the speakers uh, and are not necessarily endorsed by the University of Regina, by SIPSERT or its sponsors, or the speaker's respective employers or organization. The webinar reflects the speaker's current perspectives based on their experience and review of the literature, which may differ in another specific context or may change with new research findings and as new information becomes available. With that, uh, we'd like to welcome you to the webinar, and uh, please feel free to take it away, Dr. Simon Hatcher. So, uh, good afternoon, Kiara, bonjour to uh, everybody. Um, thank you so much for giving up uh, part of your day today to um, discuss this important talk topic around suicide prevention and public safety personnel in Canada. Um, the reason I'm talking about this is because um, I'm leading a research and first responder team that is um, trying to develop a suicide prevention uh, plan for public safety personnel in Canada over the next three years. And I'm going to tell you um, what I think we're going to do and then you can tell me what I what what you think I should be doing. Um, and basically the, the two quick key questions are what, what would a suicide prevention plan actually look like and, and who should be involved in designing it? Um, so that's what I'm going. To, that, that, that's what I'd like to discuss. Um, the way I'm going to do this is um, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about suicide prevention, well, suicides in public safety personnel. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of, um, well, one inquiry and uh, a couple of studies I've been involved in, and uh, then I'm going to talk about how we're going to do the suicide prevention uh, plan. Um, and uh, open up the discussion by talking about how to get big projects done and some of the uh, fundamentals uh, around doing any big project and I want to see if we, if we actually tick some of them off with this project um, 
and hopefully at the end of this um, we can have a discussion about well what, what should a suicide prevention plan look like and who should be involved now i because this is a bloody go-to webinar mickey mouse thing um i'm not entirely sure what you can see whether you can just see my face or whether you can see um the um uh the powerpoint presentation i have here uh, we, um, we can in fact see both dr hatcher oh how scary all right so um so first of all talking about suicide uh can be difficult and it provokes strong feelings so um i always put this up as a bit of a, bit of a disclaimer um if you want to talk to somebody about um suicide you're worried about somebody or yourself uh here are some numbers uh from november this year it's going to be a three digit 988 number but this is what is currently the case uh if you're in ontario of course uh, boots on the ground do fantastic fantastic job and they provide um uh crisis assistance or a, a crisis line for first responders there um so that's just the preamble um so what's the situation uh the, just the general situation around suicide in canada so um in the general population about 10 people a day die of suicide in canada um in 2021 uh, people usually say about 4,000 people a year die of suicide but one of the odd things about the pandemic is the number of suicides has actually reduced it's gone down from about 4,400 4,300 a year down to about 3,800 now um, nobody quite knows why um, we're, we're doing a study to try and answer that question but um, it is still um, it's about 10 people a day the population rates about 10 per 100,000 the rate hasn't changed much in the last 10 years except uh, during the pandemic and um, the, the usual picture around suicides is that most of them are done, most completed suicides are middle-aged men, essentially. Um, it's not a youth problem, it's not a teenage problem. Um, it's uh, something that is done uh, by men and half of all suicides are men between the ages of 30 and 65. So that's the general picture around uh, suicide in Canada. So. Um, so one of the things I was involved in, one of the reasons why I'm giving this talk, I think, is that back in 2018, um, I was part of an expert panel on police officer deaths by suicide, which was um, uh, created by the Office of the Chief Coroner in Ontario. And uh, he was concerned about the number of police suicides um, uh, that had been occurring recently and uh, he convened this expert panel to come up with recommendations and we had input from various delegations including the Toronto Police Association, um, various other associations and there were um, two or three uh, police representatives on the expert panel as well. Um, and what we did is um, we looked at uh, nine police officer deaths which occurred in 2018, it's almost like there was a cluster and we came up with a number of uh, recommendations, uh, number of findings. So there were significant issues around stigma. Um, nobody wanted to talk about mental health problems or didn't know how to talk about them. There's, there, there was issues around identity. Um, of the nine police suicides in 2018, um, I think three or four of them involved disciplinary issues and uh, issues with uh, losing their identity being kicked out of the police essentially um, and that seemed to be a very high risk time um, for uh, this particular group um, another issue were the high cost of accommodation um, people were one of the reasons people were very reluctant to talk about mental health problem is that they saw it as an unsolvable costly difficulty which resulted in long-term disability for months and years which the uh, force would have to pay for. Um, another issue was the unintended consequences of presumptive legislation. Um, around about that time, uh, presumptive legislation was introduced in Ontario, which means that uh, the assumption was that if you put in a claim for uh, PTSD, then uh the assumption would be that that was caused by your work and there was no need to prove it 
Um, this had some un unintended consequences as people who would otherwise maybe be diagnosed with depression or substance use uh, were um, uh, being treated and helped as though they had PTSD. Um, it's not all about the work. Um, in these nine police officer suicides, there's also significant uh, life events going on as well as work. And um, the part of the culture, as I'm sure this audience knows, is that the commitment to duty uh, trumps any personal care. Um, so those are some of the issues that came up during that panel. And we made some recommendations. Um, the first recommendation was that somebody had to own the problem. Um, one of the one of the difficulties was that nobody seemed to own the problem of mental health in policing. Uh, it was always it was left to other people to um, to lead on that. So we suggested that um, the uh, policing services division uh, should actually create a body to try and own the problem. Um, one of the things that comes up repeatedly when you talk about this issue is that uh, public safety personnel feel that healthcare providers don't know what job they do. And you know, the, the classic quote is, I made my psychologist cry because um, I told them um, what uh, I had to do at work. So ensuring some sort of health competence, uh, uh, cultural competence is important. Um, referrals to help needed to be managed better. Um, there, um, there are many barriers to getting help. Uh, especially if you go through a workplace injury process. Um, it is complicated. Nobody knows how to do it. Um, and uh, you know nobody knows how to do it because WSIB and other organisations have to produce guidance documents to tell you how to do it. And they're often not entirely 100% correct. Um, various police services need to develop a mental health and wellness strategy. Um, uh, there needs to be guidance on transitions to and from work. One of the, I mean, one of the reasons, one of the reasons I'm talking today is partly because I'm leading this uh, development of a public safety personnel suicide prevention strategy, but also I, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a clinician, and for the last uh, five, six years, I've been running a, a, a mental health clinic for public safety personnel. And one of the things that um, you see in people I see is that no, nobody knows what, 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 how to talk to people when they're off work. Um, and you can pretty much guarantee that the people who do well and go back to work are the ones who still get invited to the um, platoon barbecue uh, whilst they're off work. Um, if they're not, uh, and if they're left on their own and completely isolated and um, cast out from the herd, um, my some of my clients, some of my public safety patients' words, not mine, um, they're the ones who tend to do badly. Um, and there needs to be some guidance and high risk handoff processes. So when people are being disciplined, when they are being threatened with legal action, um, that there is some guidance about how to do this well. So those were some of the recommendations from uh, that uh, uh, expert panel. That was based on just police um, and just nine suicide deaths. We did a subsequent study and uh, we looked at public we looked at uh, suicide amongst public safety personnel compared to uh, the general public in Ontario. And uh, this is what we did. Um, one of the difficulties of working in this area is that nobody actually knows how many public safety personnel died by suicide. Um, it's actually really hard to find out. Um, and that's partly because nobody keeps a record of it. Um, coroners who make the decision about whether a death is due to a suicide, don't uh, routinely use occupational codes. So you can't just press a button on a computer and find out how many doctors or police or firefighters um, died by suicide over a particular time. And again, it doesn't seem to be anybody's job to track um, uh, suicides amongst public safety personnel. So to actually find this out, we, we had to ask a lot of people. Um, we asked a lot of uh, Facebook groups, uh, professional groups, associations uh, to identify people they knew who did die by suicide over the five years between the beginning of 2014 to the end of 2018. And we also used newspapers, social media, uh, obituary sites uh, and, a, and the Ontario Community of Practice for 
public safety personnel to uh, ask for details about suicides that people knew of. And by the time we collected, um, uh, we'd exhausted that, um, we matched each uh, public safety personnel suicide with two uh, general public suicides. And we matched them by to age, sex, coronial region and year of death. So if you were a public safety personnel who, died, who was male, age 46, uh, who died in Peel, and you died in 2015, we found uh, two 46-year-old males uh, from Peel who also died in 2015, uh, but who weren't uh, public safety personnel as a, as a comparison. And we used these uh, to search coroner records of suicides. Okay. Um, we found out quite a few things. This is, uh, it's, it's never good to, be, to present tables in talks because nobody can ever read them. This is the only one I'm going to present. Um, so we found uh, 37 uh, public safety personnel suicides in those five years. Um, over those five, uh, most of whom were police, that's 22. And if you do the simple maths, that gives them a s annual suicide right rate, which is uh, somewhat higher than the general population. And then you look at fire, paramedic and corrections, and you'll see that their rates are somewhat um, lower than the general population. But it's always hard to know what you can what, what you compare suicide rates with, of course, because um, you know, if you're employed and you're healthy enough to be a fireman, then uh, you're in a pretty low risk group for suicide. So probably any number is indicates uh, 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 an increased risk. It's, uh, uh, it's always difficult to know what you compare suicide rates with. Um, the point I wanted to make from this is that uh, uh, deaths by police were, most, were the most common deaths by suicide that we found um, over this five years. And the other thing to point out is during those five years, as far as I know and as far as I've been told, only one uh, member of the police force in Ontario died in the line of duty, um, uh, uh, well, due to, due to others uh, as opposed to um, suicide during that time. Um, that's what uh, I have been told, which tells you something about the degree of importance of uh, suicide in mortality rates uh, associated with occupation in public safety personnel. What else do we find? Um, I have tables, but I thought I'd just use words instead. So obviously police have higher suicide rates than uh, other public safety personnel groups. Uh, compared to the general population, uh, public safety personnel who die by suicide were more likely to be divorced and separated. And they're more likely to die in a motor vehicle and much more likely to use a firearm. Uh, they're more likely to have PTSD and they're more likely to have problems at work than the general population. There's also significant uh, differences in um, the lack of risk factors and methods. So. Uh, compared to the general population, public safety personnel were much less likely to die as a result of jumping, and less likely to have a diagnosis of drug abuse. And uh, the other interesting thing is that only one of the public safety personnel deaths was in a woman, which is significantly fewer than the general population because you expect about 25% of suicides to be in women. So that was um, an interesting finding. And it may it may just reflect the gender and sex makeup of public safety personnel. I'm not too sure about the argument, but it may be just that. Um, so that's the study we did, which uh, we're just in the process of getting published. Uh, this is another study uh, which has uh, looked at US data from 2015 to 2017. And this basically came up with the same findings, really. Um, they looked at something called the uh, National Violent Death Reporting System, only in the US. Um, and they found that 1% uh, of all suicides were in first responders in this database. Again, most were in police. Uh, firearms were more likely to be used uh, than, uh, than uh, people who weren't first responders. Um, uh, job problems and physical health problems are more frequent. Um, 
and some risk factors are significantly low in first responders, the history of suicidal thoughts, previous suicide attempts and substance use problems were significantly lower in first responders, which is actually quite important when you come to designing a suicide prevention strategy for um, PSPs because um, one of the biggest risk factors in the general population is previous suicide attempts and uh, being admitted to hospital with a suicide att attempt or intentional self-harm. So one of the biggest impacts you can have in the general population is treating this group better. But that isn't going to work for first responders because um, they tend not to go to hospital with intentional self-harm. So the summary of the, the very limited work actually that's been done on suicides and uh, uh, in, in first responders is that um, PSP suicides are different to the general population. Um, it's a mistake to lump all PSPs together and treat them as the same. Um, it appears that easy access to lethal means is important. Uh, one of the things to point out with all the firearm, with the firearm deaths in police, is that 90% um, of them were done by done using a service weapon. So, storage of service weapons might be a target for any suicide prevention strategy with police. Um, threats to identity are important. Um, identity is a really important issue, as people on this audience know. Uh, and when that's threatened, um, that needs to be managed well. Uh, PTSD is more common than the general population, but you can't forget that depression and alcohol abuse are actually more common than PTSD in a first responder population. Um, nobody knows what the true rates of suicide are in uh, public safety personnel. We just don't know. We, we can approximate, but we don't know. And the rates of important risk factors are not known. For example, presenting to hospital with attempted suicide. Um, I have no idea how you'd find that data. Um, I've got some ideas, but I have no idea how you'd reliably find how many firemen or uh, police uh, would present to hospital with, suicide, with a suicide attempt and therefore present as uh, an opportunity for suicide prevention. So, that's a bit of the background around uh, suicide in uh, public safety personnel. Um, given, given that, um, and that people see this as a pressing problem, uh, we, I say we, so it's a research team and it's a uh, study advisory group um, uh, lodged within SIPSERT, um, have been funded by the Canadian Institute for Health Research to develop a suicide prevention strategy for public safety personnel in Canada over the next three years. Uh, it started in July and it's due to finish in June 2026. We've got a start date and an end date. What are we going to do? Um, some of it is the nerdy pointy hat stuff. So we're going to get, gather some evidence. So we're going to find out um, what are the important risk factors for suicide uh, and identify high risk PSP groups. And we're also going to, so, so we're going to basically collate the world literature on suicide and public safety personnel and convert that into data we can use to design a suicide prevention strategy. We're also going to look at suicide prevention strategies uh, right, as opposed to individual risk factors, but suicide prevention strategies that have been used elsewhere in public safety personnel organizations, there's not that many, and also in the military. Um, I mean, the military got very important differences to public safety personnel, but I think you can also extrapolate some lessons learned from suicide prevention strategies used in the in the military. And we'll do a review a review of all those and try and answer what worked for whom and why. Given all that data, um, we will then do some what's called systemic system dynamic modeling, which is the clever scientific bit. Um, and systems dynamic modeling is a way of taking into account the different um, suicide prevention strategies, which may or may not work in first responders, and seeing where you get your biggest bang for your buck. Because not, you know, we are we all work in resource constrained organisations, and we don't necessarily know what works uh, for whom, uh, and what works for police may not work for fire uh, or for paramedics. Um, so um, what we're going to be doing is some uh, dynamic modeling and um, also, and this is part of it, um, we're going to 
talk to key stakeholders around two things. One is, well, always bearing the end in mind. If you had a suicide prevention strategy, what, what would it look like? Uh, would it be law? Would it be training? Would it be policy? Who knows? Uh, what you know, What's already worked in your organizations? And then we're going to um, also uh, use key stakeholders to make sure that we are asking the right questions and um, making sure you don't go off into a nerdy academic piece and uh, make sure we keep things relevant and make sure that the model stays accurate. And then having used the modeling, then we can come up with recommendations around what a suicide prevention strategy and plan should be and we'll create it. And then the next study is we'll see how effective it is. We haven't got funding for that yet. So that's what we're planning to do in the next three years. The system dynamic modeling piece, we're working with some Australians. Bloody hell, Australians. Um, and um, this is what system dynamic modeling looks like. Um, I, I wasn't going to risk doing this live on my computer, but um, this is an example of a model that they produced in Australia to uh, inform their planning to reduce veteran suicides um, uh, in Australia. Um, this is what the model looks like from the outside. It, there's quite a lot of stuff under the cover, but what you can see is that on the left hand side here you have completed veteran suicides. Uh, on the right hand side you can have you have the cumul cumulative suicide deaths going from 2018 to 2028. So um, I think this model was actually produced in 2018, which is when they start there. And you see um, here you have various interventions like uh, what so what how, how does this change the number of completed suicides uh, each year if you increase screening? Uh, what do you do if you produce uh, if you have psychiatric assistant dogs? Uh, what happens if you increase the number of health professionals and so on and so forth? Um, what happens if you get much better at PTSD prevention? How is that going to affect completed veteran suicides? And you can you can combine these different interventions and see where you get the biggest bang for your duck, uh, buck. And these are the sort of questions that you can test in the model. So what if we could reduce the onset of PTSD in in this example, of veterans, but in, for, in public safety personnel. Um, what, what, if, what would we do if we did nothing around female veteran suicides? What, how, what would that change? How would that change things? Um, uh, uh, what if we could dis, uh, what if we could improve the quality and availability of psychological treatments in veterans? So you can ask all these questions. So. Um, You'll see in this screenshot, I turned on assertive aftercare. Uh, I turned on uh, developing a network of excellence. Um, I think yeah, it's just those two things. And you'll see that uh, that one, run two, which I think is assertive aftercare, does actually decrease the number of veteran suicides uh, after a while. Um, but surprisingly, I don't know how they got away with it, but um, in this particular model, uh, turning on the network of excellence actually had the biggest impact on uh, veteran suicide. Um, one of the, one of the things about working in the veterans world, especially in Australia, is it, it's a bit like Canada. Nobody actually knows how many veterans are or where they go. Um, so a large part of this model um, makes assumptions about the size of the veterans population uh, and uh, what services they use. Um, we're not so much in the dark in Canada around public safety personnel, but this is an example of of um, uh, first uh, of systems dynamic modeling. This is what it this is what it looks like, and you can you can pretty much you know the the, uh, the uh, talking to different stakeholders, doing the literature search, looking at what works in other suicide other suicide prevention models uh, will will tell us uh, what these um, interventions should be. Some things though are difficult to model. Like uh, one of the things I think is clearly needed is a national public safety personnel suicide review body. Um, there are examples of this for uh, suicides in, in the general population in different countries, and there's evidence uh, that they do make a difference. Um, death review committees is something that um, 
uh, coroners and uh, solicitor general offices in provinces around Canada are responsible for. There are, and they're usually set up for deaths that shouldn't happen. So, for instance, uh, maternal deaths. You know, no, nobody should really die when they give, child, give, give birth to a child. So, when one, one, when one does, that needs to be reviewed. Um, and the same, really, I think, should apply to um, public safety personnel suicides. So, certainly, one of the things I think uh, would make a big difference is actually having a national safety personnel suicide review body. That's my opinion. Um, but it's quite hard to, to to model that. We can we can do a best guess. And the thing about modelling is it's okay with best guesses. You can um, you can you can put in a range of effects for each one. Um, one of the recommendations from the expert panel that we made was that coroner records should include occupational codes, um, so that it is actually easier to identify public safety personnel. And you can actually answer the question: How many public safety personnel deaths are there in Canada each year? Um, Organisational changes. Um, when I see people clinically, the one time people get really angry, they cry, they thump the table, um, is when they describe the effect of the toxic organisation on them, when they feel either humiliated um, or uh, uh, abandoned or judged by their organisation. Um, and again, it's difficult to know how to incorporate that into a model. Um, but again, um, it's better than doing nothing. So those are some of the things which are difficult to model. Um, I don't know how many people know this book, um, but Bent Fleberg is a Dane, and he's the world expert on why uh, big projects um, don't get done. Um, this is things like the LRT in Ottawa, so which are overspent, um, over budget, and underachieving, uh, and late. And he's the world expert. He has a database of all these big projects, and he's and he's come up with a lesson and uh, um, a set of um, guidelines about how to make big projects work and how to get them done. And I've summarised it here, and I think it's a it's a good way of thinking about developing a suicide prevention plan for PSPs. One is you think slow and act fast. So a lot of the three years on developing the suicide prevention plan is going to be thinking. And making sure we talk to the right people and making sure the right people are involved um, and actually producing the strategy is going to be quite going to be quite quick um, we need to be clear why we're doing this now obviously you know stopping people dying from suicide is a good thing but are there other reasons why we're doing this um, i'll be interested in that in a discussion around that um, modeling it modeling big projects really works um, you spend a lot of time on modeling projects to make sure that you thought of all the things that you can go wrong for instance a pandemic um, or other things which may get in the way of the project happening um, you look for people who've got experience in doing this sort of thing and you look for similar projects um, you, you plan until the cows come home you need to make sure everyone's rowing together and uh, you've got to find your lego uh, you've got to modularize things so um, uh, repeatedly do um, the same small thing well and if you do those things that's when you get big projects done um, so that's just a, a, another way of thinking about project management when it comes to developing a, a something like a suicide prevention plan across Canada for PSPs so those are the two questions I want to leave you with um, thinking from right to left thinking for the end what would a successful public safety personnel suicide prevention strategy look like and what, are, what sort of things already make a difference in the workplace and who should be involved? I mean, clearly public safety personnel should be involved, but who else? Um, so I'd be interested to know the, what people think is the answer to those questions. And that concludes the uh, entry from the, uh, Ot from the Ottawa contestant. There you go. I don't know whether you can see me. There you go. But there you go. See, I've killed off. Nobody's dared to ask any questions. Well, uh, thank you very, very much, Dr. Hatcher, for the presentation. Um, and we actually do have some questions from the chat that have been coming in oh, over the course of the presentation. Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, I do have uh, those for you, as I said uh, in my uh, in the chat right. in my earlier housekeeping. I did neglect to mention that if you want to be a question asked anonymously, please uh, indicate as such. Uh, the first question that we had came in. Uh, 
and the asker wanted to know what, if external non-work factors, create suicidal ideation tendencies that someone is affected by and distracted by while at work? Well, the, the psychology of suicide is relatively straightforward. It's when people feel hopeless and trapped. That, that, that's when people uh, start thinking of suicidal ideas, uh, where they feel there's no hope left, uh, which is why it's often associated with depression, and when they feel trapped, they feel they can't change anything. And the other bit which is a bit toxic is the angry bit, um, which is a bit under research. But it's essentially, suicide is about hopelessness and entrapment. That, that's the that's the simple answer. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, another anonymous question from the chat. Uh, when looking at suicide rates, did the research group uh, consider including border services officers as frontline and or first responders? Why or why not? Uh, yep. Uh, anybody who is on the Public Safety Steering Committee of SIPSA is included. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the suicide prevention strategy. And also in the study we did in Ontario, we looked for, uh, we, we specifically looked for CBSA, the border services uh, suicides during that time period, as we did for uh, CSIS and for uh, um, all the other organizations. For the, for the PS, it's, it's always hard to know where you draw the line though. For the, for the suicide prevention strategy, we are not including nurses even though they're included in the presumptive legislation, because that's a very, I think that's a very different kettle of fish. Uh, at the moment, we're not including Coast Guard. Um, the, the arbitrary rule we have included is that if they're represented on the uh, SIPSERT PSSC, the Public S Safety Steering Committee, uh, then we include them. Yeah, well, thank you for that, and I hope that that answered the questions of everybody asking about border services officers in the chat. Uh, Paul, with some personal experience from the chat, says that approximately three years ago, I was told by a healthcare professional at the Montreal Jewish General Hospital that every day a police officer would present themselves at the psychiatric ward for help. Okay. Does this resonate with you? Does the number make sense? And what are your thoughts on this? No, it doesn't resonate with me. Um... I, I work in a general hospital, um, and I've worked in a general hospital as a psychiatrist for 35 years or more. Um, since I've been in Canada, which is like 11 years now, I think I can count the fingers of one hand the number of um, public safety personnel who I know who come to hospital, to the emergency department, or by some other means, um, seeking help for mental health problems. Um, it's, in my experience, it's not that common. Um, I'm surprised that it's one person a day. I can check on that. I know people at the Jewish hospital. But one of the difficult, I mean, if, if in many ways, the paradoxically, that's actually quite good. If people are presenting for care, one of the ways in which you can which you can pre prevent suicide is providing them with providing with that care, providing them with good quality care. Indeed. Uh, Haley wants to know, do you see any opportunities to align with the National Suicide Prevention Action Plan that Public Health Agency of Canada is developing in response to Motion 174? Yep, they're involved. We've got the Public Health Agency of Canada as part of the team. Um, but um, yeah, the uh, uh, I think public safety personnel are, are, are so different from the general population that I think you can justify having a separate plan. And also this plan is going to be probably a bit more detailed. Very good. Uh, Leah in the chat, how do we best manage the stigma of suicide? Um, I think you do what a lot of workplace organizations have done and start talking about, uh, uh, um, I hate to call it wellness, but uh, operational mental fitness, something like that. You know, if, you, if you're going to do a good job, um, you need to be mentally fit as well as physically fit. And I think reframing it like that is one of the ways to address the stigma. Um, I mean, stigma is a big problem in uh, in uh, PSP. And that's partly because um, PSPs are often not only dealing with you know, traumatic incidents, they're also, also one of the first people to deal with mental health crises. And you know, they people get exposed to a um, people in distress who are acting strangely and also the perceived 
um, lack of effectiveness of mental health services. You know, the typical story is that uh, a, a, a patrol cop brings somebody to a hospital after talking them down off a bridge um, to be seen in ED, takes half the day to do it, and then an hour later he sees them back out in the street. So but I think that informs the stigma as well. So there's, yeah, there's, there's education, there's all sorts of things that we can do to address that. But I think also um, focusing on um, operational mental health fitness. It's what, the, it's what the special forces do, but they're not, yeah, so. <clears throat> That's very interesting. Um, Jenny would like to know, how can a public safety personnel organization get involved with and support this work? Uh, please email me. Um, I apologize, I didn't put my email up there. Um, my email is very straight, well, you, you can just Google me. Yeah. Yeah, you'll, you'll find my email, but it's uh, S Hatcher, S H A T C H E R at uh, T O H, which is the Bellevue Hospital C A. So it's S Hatcher at T O H dot C A. Thank you very much. I've just put that in the chat for everybody. Fantastic. Uh, we have a uh, another anonymous question coming from the chat uh, that would like some clarification. Uh, did you say that marital problems and domestic violence are more of a risk factor for public safety personnel than for the general public? And why do you think that would be? I didn't say they're more of a risk factor. They seem to be more common um, uh, as, as problems which people quote in coroner's records that preceded a suicide. Uh, divorce and um, separation were more common uh, in the... Um, public safety personnel suicides than the general population. The other thing, which I didn't say, which I think is really sad, was that um, uh, in the study we did in Ontario, um, public safety personnel were more likely to leave behind children under the age of 18 than the general population. It didn't quite make statistical significance, but they were certainly, certainly it happened more commonly in public safety personnel than in the general population. Not quite sure what to make of that, except um, it's some, it's, it, was some, it seemed to be something around uh, people with young families breaking apart suddenly. Sorry, that, that is in, indeed quite sad, as you indicated. It is. Um, it is. Got, uh, but um, one of the other things, though, one of the things it tells you is that um, any that any intervention needs to involve families? And indeed, there is a a note uh, in the chat as well about uh, involving uh, public safety personnel, families in, in any yeah. meaningful strategy. Yeah, because because they are like the canaries down the coal mine. Plus, also they're really they they're they're clearly affected, and also they're very you know, important places to work to try and heal. Really. <clears throat> Got a follow-up uh, in the chat from Paul who wants to know that, uh, do you feel that speaking up and speaking out, as is a trend today, is sufficient to the prevention of suicide in public safety personnel? How can we become more proactive in preventing suicides in PSP? Um, one of the projects I was involved in, because I, I, I came from New Zealand, I was, I was in New Zealand for 20 odd years before I came to Canada. One of the projects I was involved in there was uh, involving a rugby player a very famous rugby player who's now a knight, He's, he, he call him Sir. Um, and he was used as a face of, the, of a suicide prevention campaign, which I was, I, I sort of led the clinical side from. And um, uh, he's called John Kerwin, and uh, he was an all black, a, a, a New Zealand rugby player. And basically the strategy was get somebody famous who especially men can identify with and get him to front the suicide prevention campaign. And it was so successful that you had men coming into a primary care clinic saying, I've got to touch the Kerwins, which you know, is shorthand for saying they were depressed or suicidal. Um, so, that, the, the, so that's a long answer to the question, which is I think one of the ways in which you do powerful speaking out is um, it, it's clearly important for people on the ground to speak out, but I think it's also just as important for people in the senior and middle ranks to. To, to speak out. It, what, who you really need to get in, on board are the sergeants and the superintendents, uh, sort of middle management people, to get them speaking out about this. And maybe part of a suicide prevention strategy would be developing um, 
a website or something where you have um, you know, sergeants, superintendents, blah, blah, um, speaking out about their own experience of mental health. The other thing you do, um, this came up in the um, expert panel on police suicides, um, as a, it was a suggestion from one of the police members, is that, of course, promotion is very important in most organisations. It's very important in, in, you know, in police. Um, but making police making promotion contingent on demonstrating that you can take care of the mental health of your platoon or whoever you're you know, whoever uh, you're the whoever in the organization you are responsible for and making that part of promotion uh, interviews. I thought it was a really good idea as a way of change, trying to change the culture. Indeed. Um, now, I know uh, I'm at least marginally aware of the time, and I'm aware that we started a little bit late. We're going to try and get to your questions. Uh, if we don't get to all the questions, then uh, are people free to email you, Dr. Hatcher, to uh, seek some answers? Yeah, that, that's the whole point of me doing this presentation, is, is to get people involved in a conversation and get, you know, because there are people that I don't know who I'm sure got really good ideas about how to do this. Perfect. Well, thank you for that. But we will get to as many questions as we can in the time. Uh, Hope from Corrections wants to know who determines mental fitness for operational needs. Uh, I am aware of the stigma surrounding uh, this within my work in Corrections. Many are afraid they'll be deemed unfit by the workplace. How can this stigma be reduced? Yeah, I mean that, that's that that that's always a tension, and it's something that's not specific to Corrections or PSP. I mean, I in the hour before this presentation, I was also attending a meeting on uh, suicide prevention amongst doctors, and it's the same thing for doctors because you need to have a certain um, level of mental health to practice medicine um, and it's, it's a tension that you have to manage and I, I think the I think part of the answer is to make sure that people who make the decisions are neutral so they're not necessarily employed by the insurance company like WSIB or um, Canada Life or whoever um, uh, and that they are independent of well, as I say, insurers and people who uh, uh, who stand to lose financially if you say that they are not fit to work. Um, and it comes back to some of the recommendations you made in the expert panel in that uh, often mental health problems and being off work for mental health problems is seen as a very black and white thing. Either you're off or you're not, which is, which is not a particularly helpful way of thinking about things. And... Um, Doing some form of gradual transition both to and from work um, and managing those transitions well, I think is really important. But it, it, it's, 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 a hard, it's hard territory. It's, it, it's difficult and it's, uh, it's something a lot, a lot of people are grappling with. Uh, if anyone's found a good way of doing it, please let me know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a general question from the chat. Uh, may we have access to this presentation? Um, it's being recorded, isn't it? It, it, it is indeed. Uh, and as a reminder, attendees will get a recording of the uh, presentation within 48 hours of its conclusion. Uh, uh, Jessica would like to know what you think about hospitalizing someone who is a danger to themselves or others. If a person is not dangerous to anyone at the moment but has serious mental health problems and doesn't want to be helped, wouldn't it be too late? um yeah look it's difficult um i have the power to deprive people of their liberty um by saying that they are a threat to others and a threat to themselves um after a certain time that um, needs to be reviewed by uh, a judge as it should be uh, and there are processes within most provinces to do that um in practice um, people tend to be put on a form and compulsorily admitted to hospital if there's an acute threat to safety to themselves or to others. Um, so that's that's part of the answer to the question. The second answer to the question is that um, it's nearly all inpatient units in acute psychiatric inpatient units in Canada have very little psychology, and there's not a lot of talking therapy goes on. They're very good at preventing people accessing the means to harm themselves. But you are not going to necessarily going to get um, psychological therapy to um, fix things as an inpatient, and they can often be quite toxic environments. So um, uh, people often want people to be admitted to hospital to to fix the problem. It very rarely does. 
I mean, that's why you know, even for something which is not that acute, like um, substance abuse, there's such a relapse rate once you come out of hospital. Um, you know, people like to do these residential rehab courses, and they're great, they're fine. But as soon as you come out of hospital or out of the rehab, then you encounter the same things which made you use in the first place, and that's why the relapse rate is so high. Um, yeah, so compulsory getting people in the hospital is really it's useful when people are really acutely suicidal or homicidal. Um, just needs to be a bit more sophisticated than that um, on a more chronic level. Thank you. Do you think uh, that a PSP organization's lack of communication uh, uh, or the cause of death of a PSP contributes to the stigma or challenges and et cetera in addressing the issue? Yep. Um, yep. Uh, so th th this this territory is called postvention, and doing postvention is something that's really important because doing it well is really important. So what what do you do after somebody dies at work from a suicide, you know, whether it's uh, PSP or not? Um, is there a, is there a clear process that needs to be followed? I mean, you need to manage yourself. You need to manage the other people at work. You need to manage the family who are left. You need to manage the organisation and any media who may be involved. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to be lot, a lot to be getting on with, and um, I think any part of any suicide prevention strategy for PSP should include clear guidance on how to do that well, including how to notify the people in the organisation. Thank you. Um, we have time probably for just a couple of more questions. As I said, uh, if your question does not get asked, I apologize for that. However, we do encourage you to reach out to Dr. Hatcher, whose email address is in the chat. Uh, as a reminder, anybody who signed up for the webinar will be getting a recording of the webinar, including this Q&A uh, within the next 48 hours. Uh, question, we still hear that a lot of cases of depression, PTSD are not recognized and are leaving employees without help salary and sometimes leave suicidal ideas uh, yep. apologies not not a question there but a more of a comment yep so um in the general public suicide prevention strategies one of the things that is a common intervention is um either screening people screening people who are at high risk for depression and other psychological injuries um or um improving uh the skills of uh, people in primary care to detect uh, especially depression so that that's a that's a, a a common intervention in um the general population suicide prevention plans and it's something which um it's usually not a bad idea the evidence for it's not actually not, not that great but um it probably is something that would see that we would see in a any completed su uh, PSP suicide prevention plan. Great, thank you for that. And this will be our last question, I'm afraid. Again, if I didn't get to your question, I do sincerely apologize. Uh, what are your thoughts on passively suicidal or passive suicidal ideation? With your experience, what does this mean and how can one help? Yeah, um, usually, well, it usually means someone's pretty upset um but um which my, which my mother could probably do. um so what do people mean by passive suicidal ideation that, that could be anything from refusing to eat and drink to uh increasingly putting people putting yourself in risky situations so always volunteering to go out on the most risky uh operations or putting yourself in harm's way um and um it's uh, that I mean, that's um that's serious you really got to find out why people are thinking like that and you know it's only a, it's only a small step away from uh taking action themselves to uh harm themselves so i think it's going to be taken seriously great well thank you for that and with that we are uh going to move to the conclusion of the webinar uh again apologies to the audience for the slight technical uh, problems on our end uh, as a bit of final housekeeping, I would like to formally introduce our speaker, Dr. Simon Hatcher. Uh, Dr. Hatcher is a full professor of psychiatry at the University of Ottawa, Canada. He trained in consultation liaison psychiatry in the UK and ran a consultation liaison service in New Zealand for 20 years. 
His main research interests include suicide, self-harm, psychotherapies, clinical trials, first responders' mental health, trauma-informed care in the homeless, and e-therapies. He's been the principal investigator in several large trials of non-pharmacological interventions in people who present to hospital with intentional self-harm. The OHRI research lab he heads, Hatching Ideas Hub, focuses on clinical trials in underserved populations such as suicidal men, the homeless, and first responders. Clinically, he works in the downtown homeless shelters in Ottawa and a liaison psychiatry service at the Ottawa General Hospital. He is also the vice chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Thank you very much, Dr. Hatcher, and uh, thanks to everybody who attended today. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.